okay, we're finally done with all that planet nonsense. Um, now, as of that, we've finished pretty much what we had to cover with mechanics. Um, for the rest of the year, I usually cover, well, relativity theory, which what we're going into next, um, really as a way of just putting a cap on all the mechanics stuff, um, and then move on to, with whatever time we have left, looking at some, some optics um, and maybe some wave theory. Um, but um, I kind of debated with myself whether to cover relativity this year because we're doing it at home, but I think some of you really wanted to look at it, so, so let's give it a shot and see how this goes. Um, uh, again, it's a fairly complex topic, so um, I'm going to take it slow, and we'll do it one thing at a time and, and, and go from there. Um, it's Chapter 27 in your textbook. Now, I'm going to do this my own way because, again, I, I don't like the way they do things. Um, so I want to start out introducing where Einstein was coming from and why relativity. Um, uh, first of all, realize that relativity is just referring to relative motion. And that was around since Galileo's time. Um, in fact, I come to my whiteboard here and talk about Galilean relativity. Um, we already learned that way back in the beginning of the year. And you'll remember this example, I hope. Here's a bus, and that's the front of the bus. May not be obvious. There's the wheels. So you got the bus driver up front with a steering wheel, and then you got someone standing on the bus, even though you're supposed to be sitting. This person is standing. And then maybe there's an observer on the sidewalk. Okay? Now... Uh, some some mathematical terminology here. The bus is moving at velocity v relative to the observer on the sidewalk. Okay, um, we can look at this as as reference frames. From the guy, I can't find my cursor; it's so small. The guy inside the bus is moving with the bus. So as far as he's concerned, everything inside the bus is in his own at rest reference frame. He's not moving. The rest of the world outside may be zipping backwards from his point of view, and that's perfectly fine. Um, so the guy outside, we're going to call that the main frame. The guy outside on the sidewalk is watching him go by. Let's call that the primed frame. Okay, so let's say now the guy on the bus throws a rock at the bus driver's head. I don't know why he wants to crash, I guess. Now. We can't really use V again because we use that for the velocity of the bus. By the way, to use relativity speak, we'd say that the bus frame is moving at velocity V relative to the primed external frame. Okay, so we have two reference frames. We can think of them as X, Y axes. There's the Y axis, the X axis, and the rock is right at the origin. Now, in this guy's frame, the rock is simply moving forward along the x-axis. From the outside observer's reference frame, the whole coordinate grid is moving forward at velocity v. You get what I'm saying there, okay? So the, the two reference frames are saying that the y-axis, the x-axis may be moving relative to each other. Um, who's right? Well, remember, no one's right. Both frames are equally valid. So. Here's the velocity u of the, of the rock. What about, so I guess the bus driver observes the rock coming at him at velocity u, correct? That he just, you know, he's at rest relative to the guy on the bus. And so the only velocity is the velocity of the rock moving forward. But what about the guy outside here? What does he see? The velocity of the rock he sees, or what we call u prime, because he's in the outside primed frame, that's going to equal u, the velocity of the rock that was thrown, plus v, the velocity of the bus is moving. It, to state it more simply, the two velocities add together. Okay, And again, we saw that way, way back in September, or whenever we first talked about it. If the bus is moving at 10 meters per second and he throws the rock at 2 meters per second, the observer on the sidewalk sees the rock going at 2 plus 10 or 12 meters per second, 
relative to the ground. Okay, this is all pretty obvious stuff. And like I said, this is called Galilean relativity because even back in the 1600s, Galileo recognized that this is obviously factual. Um, so relativity is real simple. Um, velocities just add together. The velocity of some object in the unprimed frame plus the velocity that the frames are moving relative to each other equals the primed velocity. The velocity is observed from the outside frame. Okay, and if you say take some time to think about that, it just makes logical sense. Um, another way to say it is the laws of physics work in both reference frames. This reference frame, the object's moving at a constant speed. In this one, it's also moving at a constant speed. It's just a different constant speed because the frames are in motion relative to each other. Now, um, that was something that, that Einstein noticed, that the laws of physics have to be the same in all reference frames. If they're not, there's a problem. You know, if we were to, to use, um, you know, F equals MA or just our, our linear motion equations on the rock from for this guy's point of view and get maybe it takes three seconds to hit the, the driver. And then we use the same equations from the other guy's point of view, the outside observer's point of view and get a different answer. Obviously, something's wrong with one of those two sets of equations. So a very important principle here is that the laws of physics have to work correctly in all reference frames. Now, I will point out that we're going to limit ourselves here to inertial reference frames, law, uh, frames where the law of inertia holds true. If the bus had been accelerating, you know, the, the driver hit the brakes really hard, the guy on board the bus might think that there's some fictional force pulling him forward and making him stumble forward. In reality, that's because he's in a non-inertial frame. There is no mysterious force there. There's just his whole frame is accelerating. We're not going to deal with that here. We're only going to deal with inertial frames. And when we do that, we have the special theory of relativity, the more limited theory of relativity. The general theory of relativity, a, a more expansive generalized form of it, also applies to non-inertial frames. But the math there gets much, much uglier. So we, we're going to avoid that. And we'll just discuss at least a little bit theoretical at the end of the chapter. Now, that's Galilean relativity. And so far, so good. It obeys all the laws of physics. Now, one other, one thing that, that came up in the mid-1800s, James Clark Maxwell came up with a series of equations dealing with electricity and magnetism. And the details of that aren't terribly important, except for you electronics people. But one of the consequences of it is, is if you create a wave of, of electric field intensity, that wave will also generate a magnetic wave that moves along with it. And that packet of electric and magnetic waves is what we perceive as light. So we even call light an electromagnetic wave. Um, OK, great. So no big deal there, except that Maxwell's equations show that light always must travel at the same speed. And that speed, we give the symbol C. And most of you from chemistry know C equals 3.00, can't see my point, times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Light must always travel at that speed. No exceptions, can't violate it. Maxwell's equations say so. Okay, through vacuum, I should specify. It's got to be through vacuum. In other media, things can change. Um, now, that is a thing, okay? It works right in all, the, all reference frames. It's a law of physics. Now, Einstein, though, noticed a problem between these two sets of laws. Because imagine now, instead of this guy throwing a rock at the driver, what if he's shining a flashlight beam at the driver? Okay, now... From his point of view, the light beam is leaving him at a speed of C, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, which is perfectly fine. The driver sees it approaching him at, at the speed of light. Um, the observer on the ground outside, though, should see this equation hold true. So the speed of light now plus the velocity of the bus equals u prime, which clearly is greater than the speed of light. In other words, if I run toward you with a flashlight, according to this equation, the light should be getting to you faster than light. And Einstein said, wait a minute. 
something's wrong here. If Galilean relativity is correct, then Maxwell's speed of light can't be a constant, can't be correct. If Maxwell's right and the speed of light is constant, something must be wrong with Galilean relativity. And so Einstein's huge genius moment was realizing that the laws of physics need to work everywhere. And these two laws of physics that we have in place that everyone said, yeah, that's fine, they, they're, they're all both true, can't both be true. If they were both true, then the laws of physics wouldn't work in all the reference frames. Um, and so that's where Einstein's special relativity begins, with realizing that um, something's wrong with Galilean relativity or something's wrong with Maxwell's equations, okay? So he realizes he has to rewrite the laws of physics from scratch. So you know all that physics we learned all year? Yeah, doesn't quite work. Luckily, you'll notice that the bus is moving at some speed v, which is very small compared to the speed of light. And so the discrepancy there is so small that to three or four significant figures, we can just ignore it. And we can still use Newton's laws and all the equations we know and love. But if the bus were moving at some huge fraction of the speed of light, then the discrepancy would be large enough to be noticeable and our results using the equations we know would be wrong. And so we don't have to throw out everything we knew about physics. It still works for objects moving at normal speeds. But all these laws of physics that we learned, Newton's laws, momentum, all this stuff, begins to fail when you start moving closer and closer to the speed of light. And so that's where we have to focus our attention with, with Einstein's relativity model. So that brings us, I'm running low on time here, so I'll just end it with um, Einstein decided he was going to have to rewrite the laws of physics pretty much from scratch. And he had to pick which one to go with, which is right, Galilean relativity or the constancy of the speed of light from Maxwell's equations. He chose Maxwell. So the two postulates of, of special relativity, postulate number one, the laws of physics have to work in all reference frames. That we can't give up. Um, postulate number two, the speed of light is a constant. In other words, Maxwell was right. So starting with those two fundamental statements, he said now, okay, well then that means Galilean relativity is wrong. This equation of u prime equals u plus v cannot be right. We're going to have to come up with a way of rewriting it. And what he came up with was, and you're going to love this, uh, we won't go through the derivation because it's pretty ugly, u prime equals u plus v divided by 1, uh, let's see, 1 plus u v over c squared. Okay, that's actually the new form of the velocity addition equation. It's how velocities really do add, unlike what Galileo said, which was just the top of the numerator of the equation. Notice, by the way, what happens. The speed of light shows up down here. If you're moving at speeds, u and v, that are very small compared to the speed of light, 0 0.001, whatever the speed of light, fastest space probes we ever built are 0 0.000 something one times the speed of light. And so usually very small. This becomes 0, 0.000 something, and so the denominator becomes just 1. And so since the denominator is effectively 1, u prime equals u plus v, just like Galileo said. But if your velocities are large compared to the speed of light, the denominator becomes larger than 1, which reduces the overall fraction and makes it a smaller value than you would have gotten. So in reality, if I am running toward you at, you know, half the speed of light, 0.5 the speed of light, and I throw a rock at you at 0.5 the speed of light, Galileo would say it hits you at the speed of light. If you plug into this equation, you'll find it hits you at like 0.7 or 0.8 times the speed of light, less than what you would have otherwise expected. So this equation corrects everything, and if you play around with it, you find you'll never ever end up with anything reaching the speed of light. You can get to 0.9999 the speed of light, but you can never get over it. Again, because of the math of the way this equation works. I'll let you play around with the math a little bit tonight, and we'll continue tomorrow.